The Environment and War Depending on how the environment is defined, it could cause everything, it could cause nothing. I think what we want to mean when we focus on the environment is specifically, does human impact on their living environment produce feedback that sets up the conditions for war? Here you can see the shrinking of the Aral Sea between Uzbekistan and Kazakhstan caused by human use of the water for irrigation for cotton production. There are many effects that seem to emanate from the environment, like disease. Here you have a list of epidemics in China just from the 6th to the 11th century. Now plagues and greenhouse effects that have strategic and socioeconomic consequences could cause war, but I don't think this is what we mean when we mean uh, the environment causing war. For example, there was an Icelandic volcanic eruption in 1783. It caused a European-wide famine that triggered the French Revolution and led to the Napoleonic Wars in Europe. But we assume that societies uh, are affected by these types of natural phenomenon and then they adapt to it. But this is not a sufficient condition for war. The volcano's eruption didn't cause the war in Europe um, without other factors being crucial. So the criteria for evaluation in terms of the effect and explaining the variance is, does the counterfactual hold true that the absence of the environmental effect would have altered the outcome? Also, does the process explain changes across time? And were changes inevitable given the circumstances? So we're speaking really about the consumption leading to resource scarcity, typically through environmental degradation. Now, there are two types of resources we can consider in this category. The first category is non-renewable resources and, and wars caused by these non-renewables. This could be oil and minerals. These are typically resources that we associate with an easy conversion into state power. Here you can see the distribution of the OPEC members and their revenues 25 years ago and the major exporters and importers of oil. In the Persian Gulf you have the largest concentration of oil that gets exported out through the Straits of Hormuz. Wars have been fought here many times. This is a map of Central Asia and the pipelines that connect gas and oil fields. This is crucially important. Here we have crude oil reserves from 20 years ago. So Julian Simon has argued that recycling and substitution have caused the cost of primary products to continue to fall. Most raw materials have had a net drop in price since the early 1970s. However, these market values tell us little since while the population has exploded and consumption has risen, Many consumers have no market access and therefore the value of goods is still undervalued until we bring the entire developing world into a common world market then we're not going to get a true value of goods. So we're not going to focus further on these non-renewable resources because they really do fall more into traditional power resources focus. Uh, there are occasionally wars that do fight for these resources the War of the Pacific between 1879 and 1883 involved the, the country of Chile seizing territory from Bolivia and Peru and they're primarily fighting over guano deposits, which is bird poop. Bird poop has huge quantities of phosphates which are an essential ingredient in agricultural fertilizer. Phosphates can also be mined as they are in Morocco. Morocco is one of the largest exporters of that strategic resource Many, much of which they sell to uh, the United States. So the second type of resource is wars caused by the scarcity of renewable resources. And so here we're thinking about resources that should be renewable, like food, fish, forests, water, and especially fertile soils. In August of 1995, the U.S. Defense Intelligence Agency studied the hyacinth plant in Lake Victoria. Lake Victoria provides 120,000 tons of fish 
annually for the growing populations of Uganda, Kenya, and Tanzania. The hyacinth plant grows very quickly and could have overwhelmed the ecosystem on the lake, leading to socioeconomic dislocation and possibly war in the region. Another water resource that has been shrinking dramatically is the Aral Sea. Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan have had some issues in the past. In fact, Uzbekistan has actually bombed one of its neighbors over a frontier dispute. The Aral Sea's water is primarily being drained by cotton industry and the irrigation necessary to keep it viable. Oceanic pollution mostly occurs in areas of principal ship travel and along coasts of countries where you have oil spills or where there's uh, essentially pollution and garbage being dumped into the ocean. The threat to the forests is important because forests are a part of the cycle that produces oxygen for terrestrial life to breathe. And forests are chopped down often for themselves because wood is valued as a construction material and because wood is often on prime real estate for agriculture. This is the Greek island of Rhodes. The chopping down of the trees removed the protection against the wind uh, of, for the topsoil. And so the topsoil was blown away by the winds, further reducing the fertility of the soil on the island. This is a depiction of the food production distribution in the world 25 years ago. The key observation to be made is that when the Europeans created their colonies and they expanded, the lands into which they migrated were the best lands in the world for food production. European power and the power of colonies that were once European essentially have food power. If you look at Australia, Argentina, North America, these countries export food because they're the most fertile soils in the world. This is a list of famines over the last 200 years in different parts of the world. We have here a list of famines in the Horn of Africa and Sudan, and another one focusing on India, China, and states in the Middle East and Asia. Famine has killed more people than any other source of death. When people die of disease in large numbers during plagues, much of it is influenced by the quality of the diet that affects the immune system of those that are affected. There are large-scale environmental processes, in this case El Nino, which is a cyclic maritime temperature warming, that creates cycles of drought that has affected famines in the developing world. However, it's not necessarily going to cause famines because of the way state structures work and because you have the UN with its World Food Program that shifts food supplies around in order to deal with famines. In fact, more food is produced today per capita than at any other time in history. The mass starvations predicted in the 1960s due to overpopulation have never materialized. The growth of the world population has been falling from its 1960 peak of 2% 2 to 1.25% in 2001 and is lower today. So there's little pressure on the food supply anyway. These are the zones where drought occurs during El Nino. And here you can see the specific global drought was 1876 to 1878. You can see here starvation in China that occurred in that period. Between 1950 and 1990, the world's population went from 2.5 to 5.3 billion. Every year, the world's population grows by about 90 million and will reach 11 billion by 2050. Here you can see the incredible growth of the human population. It doesn't mean humans have a huge biomass. The, the total weight of all the ants in the world is greater than the weight of all the humans. And you can fit the entire population of, of Earth into Rhode Island. So here we have a depiction of the ratio of cultivated land to population. Over the next 50 years, total high yield agricultural land will drop as the human population rises and occupies that land for urbanization. In the past, 
there have been dramatic changes in the ecology caused by natural environmental cycles that may have influenced the opportunities and the frequencies for war. They are, however, extremely difficult to measure. But I do want to emphasize that there's been a lot of research in the last 10 years identifying various solar systemic cycles, cycles to do with uh, um, the, even the rotation of our, our uh, galaxy um, that have created recurring patterns that have been associated with the rise and fall of human civilization. Here are temperature changes, and you can sort of cross-reference the rise and fall of temperatures with wars that occurred in different parts of the world. Maybe there's a relationship, maybe there isn't. Here we can see the rise of the ocean and the impact it's going to have on Bangladesh, and it's already manifested itself as an aggressive migration of Bengalis from Bangladesh into India particularly into the northeast area where the Bengalis are causing social disruption because the indigenous tribes in the northeast area of India are arming themselves. And so it's become an interstate issue as India tries to keep migrants from coming from Bangladesh. Taking our environmental analysis to an absurd extreme, we could extend uh, the continental drift 250 million years into the future, see how it ends up, and then ask questions about uh, whether um, it's going to matter. So here we have uh, one case of Genghis Khan, the Mongol invasions, and sunspots. Many kinds of associations can be made uh, like this. And it, they're, they're actually sort of fascinating. The problem is they generally indicate the fall or the rise of human civilization, and they don't very often predict specific wars. So nomadic expansions have occurred periodically, and it's unclear but plausible that it's tied somewhat to ecological cycles. Waves of nomadic expansion uh, have been known to occur during periods uh, that are warming, in which desiccation destroys the central grazing lands of nomadic herdsmen, and have pushed the forests back from along the perimeters of the plains. A push factor caused by overpopulation relative to the grazing land available and a pull factor having to do with the natural retreat of the forests tends to contribute to nomadic invasions and seems specifically to have occurred during the Mongol invasions under Genghis Khan. There is some evidence that these microcycles of ecological change co-vary with the occurrence and non-occurrence of sunspots on the surface of the sun. Every second, 5 million tons of matter are converted into 400 trillion trillion watts of energy. Sunspots are dark regions on the surface of the sun, the photosphere, which are cooler than the surrounding surface. These sunspots occur less frequently during the sun's quiet period along with solar flares. Frequency ranges from none to about 100 during active periods. And these are up to 40,000 miles across and last approximately three weeks. Here you can see a space environmental overview for the period of 1983 to 2012 using different measures including uh, sun rays. The Chinese observed sunspots about 2,000 years ago. The Italian astronomer Galileo Galilei from 1564 to 1642 studied them. The theory is that the sun's magnetic field restricts the flow of energy to the surface creating these sunspots. Sunspots occur in 11-year cycles and have weather effects which include dramatic heating and their absence which is associated with dramatic cooling. The 1645 to 1715 period was a period that was quite quiet. There was 70 years with no sunspots. This corresponded with the Little Ice Age in the world of that period. There is some marginal circumstantial evidence, such as the retreat of the forests prior to the Mongol expansion, that coincides with the presence of the sunspots. This may also explain the expansionary period of other nomadic tribes in history. Many peoples, including the Manchu, 
of China, the Persians, the Turks, and the Hungarians and Finns are formerly Asiatic mounted nomadic peoples that settled within agrarian populations, usually by force and fortunately before gunpowder became too prevalent. The Ming fell after pushing military reform, an opportunity seized by the Manchu adventurers who pushed south during the mini ice age freezing in the 1640s. You can see here areas where you had advanced civilizations that were on the edge of where there were nomads, going way back to the beginning of recorded history. Here we have the early expansion of Semitic peoples 5,000 years ago into Sumeria. We have also the question of the expansion of Islam from the Arabian Peninsula. It's still unclear how much of the expansion was motivated by the power of ideas versus how much of it by ecological changes in the Arabian Peninsula that act as a push factor. Now Dixon Hill is a researcher at the University of Toronto and he had a project to look at the impact of the environment on war. Now, he has a number of hypotheses. Hypothesis one is decreasing supplies of physically controllable environmental resources, such as clean water and agricultural land, would provoke interstate simple scarcity conflicts and resource wars. So the countries would fight each other if there was a shortage. There is little evidence, however, that environmental scarcity causes simple scarcity conflicts between states. He found scarcities in land or forests caused by envir environmental degradation do not cause resource wars. Most environmental scarcities and degradations lead to intrastate rather than interstate violence. So here's a graphic representation of the logical components of Dixon Hill's model. The second hypothesis is that large population movements caused by environmental scarcity could lead to identity group clashes. Here is the model for it. There is substantial evidence that environmental degradation leads to population movements that do cause domestic violence, but little evidence that this leads directly to interstate war. His third hypothesis is that severe environmental scarcity would increase economic deprivations and disrupt key local institutions. So even this may not be true, according to an Economist article. As natural disasters and war seem to tap inefficiently used resources and therefore do not have a detectable long-term drag on growth. The deprivation hypothesis over predicts civil strife, which simply does not happen. Most poor do not revolt for lack of wealth and organization. There is no correlation between poverty or income inequality and domestic level conflict. What is an acceptable or legitimate level of poverty or income inequality depends on the value system of the population in question and varies across different regions in the world, which is why we have a world with very, very poor and the very, very rich. Because disorganized populations are the least likely to revolt, we don't often see the poor engaging in the biggest wars or starting uh, interstate conflicts. Now these types of conflicts could lead to state fragmentation. But as Colin Cal, a researcher from uh, Columbia University has argued and shown in Kenya in the mid 1990s, environmental degradation could be used by the government to weaken its population to enhance its ability to rule. However, social inequality acts against a strong middle class that could inhibit decisions for war. So here we have a case of Senegal and Mauritania. In the spring of 1989, Mauritania and Senegal almost went to war because of a dispute grounded in environmental problems. In the spring of 1989, the killing of a Senegalese farmers by Maur Mauritanians in the river basin triggered ethnic conflict in both countries. In Senegal, almost all of the 17,000 shop owners, uh, shops owned by the Moors were destroyed and their owners deported. The Mauritanian regime implemented, implemented legislation to reclassify those who lived along the river as Senegalese and thereby strip them of their property, with 70,000 black Mauritanians expelled to Senegal, from which some launched raids to recapture their land. 
Several hundreds died in both countries, and the two states almost went to war. Background. In the 1950s and 60s, about 300,000 landless Salvadorian peasants and unemployed workers, both campesinos and the semi-skilled, had illegally migrated into the less densely populous western Honduras and begun cultivation of the region. These impoverished individuals came to one-eighth of the total population of Honduras, and their entrance into the market created considerable resentment among Honduran workers. This was not a simple scarcity dispute between states, but arose from the ecological marginalization of Salvadorian peasants in El Salvador and their consequent migration into a neighboring state. Between May of 1967 and June of 1969, some 12 clashes occurred by military forces along the officially disputed Salvadorian-Honduran border. Honduras also had a substantial trade deficit with El Salvador. A new Honduran regime instituted a land reform program designed not to alienate the landed cattle barons of the Honduran region. This gave the land of the Salvadorian squatter fields to native Honduran ranchers. Salvadorians were often evicted just as they were about to harvest their crops, and about 17,000 of them were initially deported by force and returned to El Salvador with reports of persecution. This program took the form of particularly violent expulsions of at least 75,000 of the 300,000 Salvadorian immigrants in May and June of 1969. In response to the expulsions, El Salvador broke diplomatic relations with Honduras on June 26, 1969, and Chancellor Guerrero explained the move as such, quote, the government of Honduras has not taken any effective measures to punish these crimes which constitute genocide, nor has it given assurances of indemnification or reparations for the damages caused to the Salvadorians, close quote. Beginning in mid-June, members of the Salvadorian oligarchy began to openly discuss an invasion of Honduras. On Sunday, 29th June, El Salvador defeated Honduras at Aztec Stadium in Mexico City at the conclusion of the three-game World Cup playoff series, and nationals from the two countries engaged in a melee in the stands. This immediately led to an anti-Salvadorian riot in Honduras. Already in the first game of the series on June 8th, an El Salvador fan shot herself because of a 0-1 defeat, and the funeral was televised in El Salvador. During the game in, El in San Salvador, El Salvador, the capital of El Salvador, a dirty rag was raised instead of the Honduran flag during the game. Starting on the 2nd of July, more Salvadorian troops were caught up, were called up to the frontier as another 25,000 people were forced to cross into El Salvador from Honduras, all of them relating tales of Honduran brutality. Sensationalistic media coverage contributed to the nationalistic ardor the patriotic fervor, and pressure for war within both nations. Both governments were too politically weak to the extent that they were unable to resist the popular war fever. On July 12th, El Salvador rejected the call by the Central American Mediation Commission for a mutual withdrawal of soldiers from the border areas. Two nights later, on July 14th, 1969, El Salvador invaded Honduras. The Salvadorian plan was to reach the Caribbean in five days and Tegucigalpa in three days, but they were slowed down by the difficult terrain. The Honduran Air Force retaliated by successfully bombing oil targets in the cities of El Salvador, but could not long resist the attacking Salvadorians who had a larger army. The war officially ended as a ceasefire gradually went into effect, beginning at 10 p.m. on 18th July. El Salvador's grudging acceptance of the troops, which the military opposed, followed embargo threats by the Organization of American States. Between 2,000 and 6,000 people died in the fighting. Had the environmental cause been a sufficient cause of the war, then it must be true that had the environmental cause not been there, there would have been no war. It seems without the degradation of the land and the consequent migration from El Salvador to Honduras, uh, if that had not occurred, then the principal cause of the war would also not have followed.
River basins and war. Rivers matter because they provide irrigation for food. Downstream riparians are at the mercy of the behavior of upstream states who could divert water. For example, China's damming of the Mekong River has had a huge impact not only on the water supply to Southeast Asia, Vietnam, Thailand, Laos, but also, and Cambodia, but also has undermined river transportation because those rivers are major ways for barges to move up and down the countries. Water disputes involving war are rare, and it's not clear why so, so few wars occur over such an important resource. For example, Ethiopia, uh, rather, Egypt has threatened to bomb Ethiopia because Ethiopia has engaged in a huge program of building dams and electrification. The Blue Nile from Ethiopia provides 70% of the water that ultimately ends up in the Nile that goes to Egypt. Here you can see some of the largest river basins in the world. Here you can see the Nile water system both in the actual geography and then structurally. Now rivers and disputes have occurred. Syria and Iraq had a confrontation in 1975. 80% of Iraq's water comes from outside its borders, including Turkey, Iran, and Syria. Iraq voiced concerns with Turkish and Syrian dam projects in the 1960s and the 1970s, but preferred bilateral discussions with Syria. Of the Euphrates water that flows into Syria, an estimated 17 billion cubic meters, Iraq demanded 13 billion, thus leaving only 4 billion for Syria. To meet her water needs, Syria demanded that the Euphrates River should be divided equally between the two countries. This is a dam construction project in Turkey. When in July of 1974, the Syrians completed the Tabaka Dam on the Euphrates River to divert water for irrigation, and one month after the 1975 Algiers Agreement between Iran and Iraq, the Iraqis accused the Syrians of unfairly diverting the water. The dispute led to some provocations and the massing of troops on their common border in, the, in June of 1975. The subsequent Iraqi, Iraqi clash with Syria led the Soviets to cut arms shipments in late June and early July to Iraq, and this lasted until August of 1976. Iran and Afghanistan have conflicted over the Helmand River historically for centuries, but the water dispute was resolved with a sharing arrangement in the 1973 Helmand River Water Treaty. This is the common border, and you can see the river crossing over that border. The Syrian-Israeli dispute over the Jordan River, however, was not resolved so specifically. The case of Syrian-Israeli dispute over the Jordan River is a case of a conflict over a water resource that strongly influenced the territorial goals of the 1967 war and was directly associated with pre-war border clashes. At the 1964 summit conference of the Arab League in Cairo, it was decided to divert the headwaters of the Jordan River, which would have seriously affected Israeli agriculture. At the same time, Israel's southward diversion of 300 million cubic meters of the Jordan River through the national water carrier irrigation system was creating an uproar among the Arab states. Initially, Israel and Syria retaliated against each other with artillery fire. When Syria began diverting two tributaries of the Jordan River, Mosh Dayan, the Minister of Agriculture, called for an immediate attack despite the risk of all-out war. The Army Chief of Staff, Yitzhak Rabin, refused. Instead, in November of 1964, Israel for the first time bombed Syrian artillery positions. When this did not stop the Syrians in diverting the river, Yitzhak Rabin deployed the Armored Corps' tanks to hit the Syrian machinery at a range of 2.5 miles. After an initial period of failure, the Israelis ultimately prevailed and the Syrians had to halt their project in December of 1964. One of the motives for the Israeli conquest of the Golan Heights was to obtain control of the headwaters of the Jordan River so vital for Israeli irrigation. The current Israeli 
control of the West Bank is vital because it provides water for Israeli agriculture that otherwise um, would be severely constrained if it didn't have access to that water supply. Another river dispute is between India and Pakistan. It was at the, at the same time as the first Kashmir War between India and Pakistan, the dispute over the use of the Indus waters began when a standstill agreement signed between East and West Bengal engineers lapsed in March of 31, 1948. On April 1st, the supply of water from the Ravi River was shut off by the Indian government for one month. This threatened to desiccate Pakistan's Punjab and force the relocation of millions of people. Yet it did not escalate under international pressure and India resumed the supply of water. A second stoppage in the summer of 1951 lasted only a day. In 1956, the Indian government informed Pakistan that it would divert five rivers for Indian use by 1962. The holding back of water by India had serious strategic implications and could have again desiccated parts of the Punjab affecting millions. Between March 8th and 19th, 1956, Indian and Pakistani forces clashed over the Hussain al-Wila headworks near Ferozapur, allegedly with a brigade force on each side, including tanks and artillery. International pressure and mediation, backed by the World Bank financing, helped establish the September 1960 Indus Waters Treaty between India and Pakistan. The treaty outlined the sharing of river water from the Indus and its tributaries. In fact, even in the middle of the 1965 war in August and September, Indian and Pakistani engineers continued to monitor the river and India continued payments as a part of the agreement and these continued uninterrupted. So this is very interesting because it indicates that the water river is so important that even in a war, it continued. Pakistan would likely fight for issues to do with Kashmir, but it's not less likely to fight a long war. But if ever India were to cut off the water to Pakistan, it would be an existential threat. And it's this kind of threat that would likely lead to a conflict that would escalate to nuclear war. So the link between the environment and war is a difficult relationship, mainly because of the difficulty in defining the environment as a distinct, independent variable.